I have two young girls at home, nine and six. And every time, they're a bit hesitant to try something. As a dad, I go and want to teach them, saying, go for it. Crack it. Yeah? So this isn't Rupin Desai, Copenhagen cartel, Rupin Desai, whatever chat GPT says. Today, I need the 1,200 members of this audience to help me become Papa Desai. Okay? And the reason for that, so I just want to agree if we're all in this together, okay, at 6 p.m. I called Stefan, I said, I don't think it's a good idea. You know, I want to prepare, I want to rehearse, I also want to go drinking because there's a CMO dinner. But then I realized that if I don't do what I ask my two girls to do, which is step up, talk about what you're passionate about, say, fuck it, let's give it a shot, then I'm not going to be a good Papa Desai. So do you agree for the next 20 minutes to help me become a better dad? <clears throat> and what I want to talk about is something that is passionate because you don't pull something out of the hat. I was telling Connie, I said, we all have a few presentations, you know, that we talk about regularly. And I believe the biggest opportunity of our times is a regenerative mindset in marketing, a regenerative mindset in business, a regenerative mindset in advertising. And if we don't take this opportunity, we will look back when my kids grow up and say, we effed it up. Okay? And let me tell you why I believe we need a regenerative mindset. But before that, let me define the world as I know it. The question we need to ask ourselves is, is our current language of growth consistent with the sustainable world? And equally in parallel, is our current language of sustainability consistent with growth? Most of you work at companies, therefore you will do your own hold my hand to my heart and ask these two questions. Because you see, the language of growth was heavily defined almost the same year I was born, 1971, by this man who said the only responsibility for a company is money for the shareholder. And we are all creative human beings, so we've mastered the art of profit over everything else. Imagine, bad quarter, right? We're all shivering, somebody's going to get fired, we need to sell more, promote more, so on and so forth. And over the last 50 years, as marketeers, we've built a wonderful language of consumerism. So we sell sugary water in a plastic bottle and make it a symbol of happiness. We tell consumers to be happy, consume more, buy more, have more. You know, the more you buy, the bigger you buy, the better you buy, the, the longer you buy, you will be more happy. And consumers do that for us by consumption. And which is why we have concepts, which is don't shave with two blades, shave with three blades. And I have quite a large surface area, and therefore I'm an authority on shaving. Don't shave with two blades, shave with three blades, shave with four blades. Let's not worry about the plastic because marketing today is language of growth is quite extractive. Look at concepts like fast fashion, right? I mean, I was just thinking this morning, it is more expensive for me to get this shirt laundered than to walk into one of those stores and buy a white t-shirt. Look at our food. Unhealthy food is far more affordable, is far more available, and is far more acceptable, and we have to convince our children to, to eat a broccoli. Right? And I'm sure all of us bought the latest version of the phone because while well, there was nothing wrong with the earlier version, we need it. And none of us are thinking about the 25 wires we carry two places and the waste marketing is generating by having a complete and extractive mindset to this. And not just this, right? Let's take a hand to our heart. This is a WFA stat on the left, which said 74% of consumers wouldn't care if the brands 
they use today just disappeared. Oh, you don't have a Coke, I'll have a Pepsi. Right? But what it means is 74% of the work we're doing is almost gigo. Garbage in, garbage out. And what is that work doing? It's adding 28% more carbon. This is a number from UK created by a company called Purpose Disruptors saying the work we're doing as a business is adding 28% more carbon to an individual's footprint. So somewhere, if we start the day and we want to listen to amazing people like Connie and Raja and Brian's going to be there and David's going to be there and my favorite friend Christina is going to be there, we have to start by asking ourselves the question, is what we're doing adding value or extracting it. And for all the businesses we work with, we must admit that while there has been a huge effort in sustainability, I mean, for the last 10 years, we're all part of some program. At best, the mindset is, let's do a little less harm. Let's continue to extract, let's continue to grow, let's continue to destroy the world, let's continue to give them four shaving blades, can we also promise them that in 2050, we will kind of do our carbon footprint, which is just kicking the can down the road with a mindset of do less harm. And therefore the question worth thinking about for all of us is, is business caught between a growth language which is extractive and a sustainability language which is do less harm? And is this a time for us as a business to look beyond these two mindsets. So the proposal I'm putting on the table, and look, don't, don't believe me. Look at the numbers. Okay, these are all statistics widely available. At today's rate, we will reach the sustainable development goals in 2073. Okay, not 2030, not 2040, not 2050. I have to tell my girls it's going to take us 132 years and I believe it's reduced by two probably, 130 years to reach gender equality. 91% of the world's plastic does not get recycled. Of the 9% that could get recycled, another 90 does not. Right? But let's buy happiness in a bottle. Okay? These are the numbers of the world we have created and every day are responsible for creating. So somewhere, if we're able to pause, as we start the day, saying, okay, our language of growth might need a change, our language of sustainability might need a change, can we think of a regenerative mindset in the way we do business, in the way we do marketing, where all stakeholders prosper, not just the shareholder? And my best definition of what is a regenerative mindset came from a book that was written by the ex-CEO of Unilever. And he explains it in a way I could explain it to my mama. It is about challenging industry to make a positive handprint on the world, not just minimize its footprint. Okay, so everything I do, every superpower I use, every decision I make, does it add value back to the world? Or does it just abuse and use and take value from my two girls, Mia and May? Remember, we are making Papa Desai matter. So if we accept that regenerative thinking is the new language that all of us need to use our superpowers for, it will need, it will mean systemic change, not just incremental not just the 1-2%, not let's make another promise that one day in 2040 we will kind of be net zero and then next year we'll move it again. And there are three areas I want to talk about that will need radical change. Today, all of us work for businesses which has one lord, one master, financial capital, and all of us are run by how much EBIT or EBITDA did you make this quarter? If we have to move to a regenerative mindset, who we serve needs to change from the shareholder alone to a multi-stakeholder where we bring well-being to people. We bring well-being to the employees. 
of course we bring well-being to the shareholder, we bring well-being to planet, and we bring well-being to community. Our financial systems of measurement will need to change. No longer do we need a financial thing of revenue, top line, cross, this and that, but we'll have to start measuring the impact across the multiple stakeholders. Now, this is an old chart I stole from when I was the CMO at Dole, saying, how can we sell fruit if our farmers don't make enough money? The food systems will be destroyed. Or what is the impact of methane we are going to cause if we don't get into regenerative agriculture? So suddenly, our measurement systems will need a radical change. Okay, so if we decide to take on the job of accepting regenerative thinking, our measurement systems will need to change. Obviously, there are many companies who are far ahead, and I'm sorry to show you a Patagonia example, but I need to, because there is a recognition that if there is no planet, the rest was nice. It's one of those cartoons saying, you know, we destroyed the planet, but at least I made some money while we did it. Okay, look at the recognition that Patagonia puts, which is build the best product, cause no unnecessary harm, and use business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. If we accept regenerative thinking as a business, we have to move away from the why to the what and the how. You know, Simon Sinek did a great job many years ago of saying, your purpose defines your why. And I love it. The second half of that sentence is what we'll have to discover. What are we making? What are we making of? How are we packing it? How are we shipping it? What value is it going to do to the environment when we throw it? These are the questions business will need to ask and marketers will need to ask if we have to accept a regenerative mindset that adds a handprint doesn't just talk about a little less footprints. I mean, there was an amazing case out, out, out of uh, Ethiopia. It's a fair chain enterprise, not even a fair trade enterprise, right? Where the owners are 50% local entrepreneurs and local employees. And by changing the business model, where they sell the final coffee bags, not the coffee beans to the West, they were able to make three times more money and reduce the carbon footprint as well. And the third radical change, if we adopt a regenerative mindset, will somewhere we'll have to start becoming amazingly humble. Because you see, if we do that, we'll face the equation of our ambitions, A, being dramatically larger than the resources we have. We don't have all the answers. It will need vital collaboration internally between public affairs, legal, product teams. It will mean searching for answers outside so that we can move faster. Yeah? So somewhere, the urge from Papa Desai is that incremental changes are not going to make the environmental crisis better. They're going to make it worse. And every minute, each one of us spends in not thinking of a regenerative mindset is a minute we have taken away from our children. I wanted to end this with two or three thoughts, but before that, I wanted to show you a piece of work, which is what my erstwhile life at Dole, where we adopted a regenerative thinking on waste. And the biggest thing I learned is waste is not waste till we decide it's waste. Every year, over 2.5 million tons of pineapples are grown in the Philippines. While the fruit is packaged to feed people all over the world, pineapple leaves are left behind. For every ton of pineapples harvested, three tons of leaves are wasted, and when left to rot could create methane emissions over 20 times more harmful than CO2. To make a change, Dole, one of the largest producers of pineapples in the world, partnered with Ananasanam to produce Pinatex a vegan, cruelty-free, and sustainable leather alternative made from the fiber of pineapple leaves that would otherwise go to waste. 
if we compare Pinatex with leather, Pinatex has a much better environmental credentials. It doesn't use any water, any land, any fertilizers. While other vegan alternatives are plastic-based and ecologically toxic, Pinatex is a sustainably sourced textile with a closed-loop production. After the rescued pineapple leaves become Pinatex, the residual leaf biomass is converted into natural fertilizer, providing a truly eco-friendly option for the fashion industry. Over 200 brands in more than 80 countries are now using Pinatex to become more sustainable, including Hugo Boss, H&M, and Nike, who use Pinatex to create their Happy Pineapple sneakers. The Dole Ananas Anam partnership through Pinatex is the perfect way for us to breathe second life into our waste. This is the first step in our journey towards circularity. Whilst helping farmers turn waste into an income opportunity. Pingatex is part of Dole's ongoing efforts to achieve zero waste from its farms by 2025. By upcycling waste, we are creating change beyond the food industry, giving fashion brands a true green answer to leather. And this wasn't a one off. Thank you. Yeah? This wasn't a one off awards season, let's do something. This has helped create a business unit where the company, in partnership with the Singapore Economic Development Board, have set up something that is going to make a lot of money, not just for the company, for the farmers, while reducing the impact it has on the planet. So the biggest opportunity of, my t of our time, in my opinion, is a regenerative thinking in whatever we do. We could be doing ad tech, we could be doing marketing, we could be doing business, we could be a CFO, or marketeers. There's a reason we've lost our seat on the table. We've become the pointy end of sales, short-term sales activation. We grew up in this business to be value creators and maybe Maybe this is the time we reclaim our seat back on the table by having a regenerative point of view on what we do in our daily lives. And I want to end with a simple thought, which is, I don't have any answers. As you notice, I've not given you any solutions, right? But we have to be committed to finding them if I need to be a good Papa Desai. So thank you very much for listening, if you were. <laughs> well done, Rupan. You pulled it off. You pulled it off. So Rupan, we, we understand, I think the majority of people here understand, the need for change. Okay? But we all know how difficult it is to pull off change versus the existing way of looking at business. You've done it yourself in Dole. What's the secret? How do you, how do you get that change going? How do, you, how do you create that momentum? Oh, wow. That's a deep... But most of us like status quo, right? Like, I'm a smoker. Okay? I have all the knowledge in my life about why I need to stop smoking. Some would even say I'm a pretty educated, sensible, rational human being, and therefore by any logical reason, I should have given up smoking. So we must accept that change is difficult. And maybe, maybe, I, Brad, sorry, I'm just going to talk to the technical team. Brad, if you could help me, I want to play you a video that I used with my leadership teams to simplify what change management means on the smallest of things we could do. Yeah? And I'm going to try and play you that video. Brad, if the one that we said we might use, if you could play that video, please. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. 
So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut, and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. For every leadership book that I've read, this probably does a bigger job of staying in my head which is as long as there is conviction about your personal purpose, and mine is to build businesses my conscience can live with, if I am ready to be the lone nut, my job is to find one more person who will dance with me. And suddenly, that, and never, never wavering in that belief system or that resilience. I mean, so eventually, if we have to change our CFOs, we have to change the capital markets, we have to change our PDI. It will require us to be lone nuts. I mean, you and I could do a TikTok moment on stage, uh, completely unscripted, and see if we dance, and then Connie joins, and then Raja joins, and then David will insist on joining, and then everybody else could join. <laughs> we could try that. Yeah? But that is the change in the simplest way uh, possible. Now, taking this parallel of the dance. How do you get your CEO to dance with you? So a CEO of a company that is listed on the stock market, quarterly results, etc. How do you bridge that tension between doing the right thing longer term while actually delivering on the business imperatives? So, dekho, I will tell you one And for a minute, I started speaking in a very different language. The starting point is, do you and your CEO and the board want to move away from the financial capitals at the cost of people or planet, or not? Right? I started Hindi. Okay, namaste. The language of business, if it is determined by no, it's profit at the cost of people and the planet, whilst let's have some leadership sessions and let's do some sessions, then you will eventually, when something hits the ceiling, profit at the cost of people and planet will. So, my urge is, don't work for a CEO who doesn't speak the language that you believe in. Or find a way to change him or her. Because if one of you speaks good Turkish and another speaks in Hindi, the one who has the ultimate power, which is the board, or the financial capital, or they call them uh, activist investors, but all they are being activist about is to make more money, and that's the reason why none of the money and GDP that has been generated over the last 10 years is actually translated to the society it was meant to make prosperous. So if you don't, then chase the right CEOs. There are amazing CEOs and amazing leaders in the world today who want that change. Right? But don't fool yourself that if you speak Hindi and they speak, I don't know, Russian or Ukrainian, uh, it's going to work. Because eventually, profit at the cost of people and planet will win. And you will have spent five years being extremely frustrated in your life. One last question for Rukman. Do you think marketing can be part of a sustainable solution? And if that's the case, what's the one thing that you'd like to see changed at an industry level in our industry to get there? We have to start thinking of value chains. You see, historically, and I'd like to say I'm too young and I don't remember, but I'm not. 
I'm 51 years old, and I remember the moment when marketeers were value creators. What product should we make? How should we package it in? What is the shipping? Why should the consumers buy it? How do we tell stories that the consumers will want more of it? We were, and then over time saying, no, 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 product is a bit separate. And then over time, let's move packaging separate. And we've ended up becoming the pointy end of selling. So it is time, I believe, that we can take back value creation, our seat on the table, and one thought I've put in front of you is a regenerative mindset. It's probably the way we can get our seat back on the table and not be, can you show me the ROI, otherwise I'm going to cut your budget, kind of day. Thank you, Rupan. Ladies and gentlemen, Rupan Desai. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.